In this lecture, we're going to take a look at planes in three-dimensional space. In this graphic I've made here, this gray rectangular object is a plane. Of course, we have to draw it in you know, a finite amount of space, but you should imagine that this plane extends in every direction forever. So while I often think of a plane like a sheet of paper, the sheet of paper really shouldn't have an edge. You may have never worked with planes before because they don't exist in R2. Right, so we've already seen lines, and when we work with lines, we have some idea of what a line is because we've studied calculus in R2, and there you have tangent lines, and you're used to writing down equations of lines. For planes, this is probably going to be new. So first, what pieces of information do you need to have in order to specify a plane in R3? I predict that the first reaction you have to that question would be three non-collinear points. What I mean by non-collinear is that the three points don't all lay on one line. So in particular, they form a triangle between them. If you hold up, say, three fingers, two on your left hand, one on your right hand, and imagine the fingertips as three points in space, if you kind of rotate them around you, you'll realize that no matter how you configure your fingers, as long as they're forming a triangle, there's exactly one plane that they determine. The set of information that's going to be most important in this lecture is one point on the plane, so a known point, and an orthogonal direction. That's somewhat similar to our viewpoint of lines in the previous lecture where we had a point on the line and a direction vector. Here we want a point on the plane and an orthogonal vector. There are other ways you could have a plane. For example, if you have two intersecting lines, they determine a plane. Okay, let's say we have the second set of information here. That's kind of the dream. You have a point on the plane in an orthogonal direction. Coming over to this graphic here on the right, let's say that this is the known point, I'll call it P. And this vector I've kind of randomly placed up here at the top, this is an orthogonal direction N. So this vector is orthogonal to the plane, kind of like if you stood your pencil up straight on your desk. So N is an orthogonal vector. This is often called a normal vector, so normal or orthogonal. You might hear that vocabulary used to describe this, this direction that's orthogonal to the plane. Then for our known point P, let's denote by R subscript zero, R naught, the position vector for this point. Now on my plane diagram, let me just label by Q any other point on the plane. So we know P is on the plane, but we would like a formula that describes every other possible point on the plane. Denote its position vector r. So this is similar to lines where r0 was the position vector for a point on the line that we knew, and r, what we wrote down was a formula for r, the position vector of any other point on the line. Analogously here, r0 is a position vector we know, and r is our unknown. So we want an equation that determines the position vector for every other point on the plane. Notice that n, the orthogonal vector, is not orthogonal to r0 or r. In fact, if you imagine drawing position vectors to other points on this plane, the angle formed with n is going to be really inconsistent. However, this vector here, the vector that goes from p to q, is lying on the plane. Therefore, it is orthogonal to n. Now we could call this vector pq, but that's not going to be very useful in our equation for the plane. So what is pq? Well, it's the coordinates of q minus the coordinates of p. The coordinates of q are the same as the coordinates of its position vector. Likewise, the coordinates of p are the same as the coordinates of its position vector. So we can solve for pq by doing r minus r naught. 
Let me label that here. And you can check the vector sum here. So R0 from tail to head, that's where P is located, R0 plus R minus R0, so you put the tail of R minus R0 there, sends you to Q, as does R. So in other words, R0 plus R minus R0 equals R. So the vector sum works out. This relationship that the vector from one point to any other point on the plane must be orthogonal to n is precisely what determines what we call the vector equation for this plane. This is an equation students sometimes struggle with because it's written with a dot product and it doesn't feel like a formula in the same way that, say, perhaps the equation of a line did. But this is our vector description of the plane. It's the formula for this plane. The idea behind this equation is any point with position vector r which makes the dot product n dot r minus r naught equal to zero must lie on the plane. And conversely, if you lie on the plane, you make that dot product zero. I don't want to get too sidetracked, but imagine that this point here is kind of above the plane. So imagine I've gone almost straight up from P and I draw the equivalent of R minus R naught. In other words, let's say this is some point U and here I'm drawing the vector from P to U. This vector is not perpendicular to M. So it wouldn't make that equation true. Similarly, if I came below the plane, say so u is down here below the plane, again, this vector is not perpendicular to n. But if u is on the plane, this vector from p to u, which is the vector we're describing as r minus r naught in our equation, lies on the plane and is therefore perpendicular to the orthogonal vector n. Okay, let's go through a few examples now to get familiar with this equation. I really like the vector form of a plane. I think it communicates information about the plane. It communicates the orthogonal vector. It gives you a point on the plane. Plus, once you understand what that dot product is saying, you understand where that equation comes from, what it's telling you. However, we do have another way to write down the equation for the plane, which is called the general equation for a plane. And sometimes students like this because it looks more like an equation. It takes out that action of a dot product. It also removes some ambiguity. Before we talk about that though, let's go ahead and see how to convert this vector equation for a plane into the general form. And then I'll also go ahead and graph this plane. At least I'll give the best picture I can based on the equation. And then we'll revisit the general equation for the plane. Okay, so if you look at this, you might recognize that it takes the form of the vector equation that we just saw. In particular, negative four, two, one, this is the orthogonal vector n. The vector x, y, z here is a vector of unknown coordinates. This represents r in the previous form of the equation. So this is the position vector r or the position vector x, y, z, where you're writing it out in component form for any point on the plane. And then the vector 1, 2, 3 is the position vector for a known point on the plane. So this tells us that the point 1, 2, 3 lies on the plane. If someone hands me an orthogonal vector to the plane and a point, this is what I would this form. But notice here, we have some actions. We have a sub vector subtraction, we have a dot product. We can go ahead and do those actions in order to convert from this form to the general form. Okay, so the first thing I'll do is the vector subtraction. So let me leave in as it is, and then we're gonna have a dot product with the vector x minus one, y minus two, z minus three. This dot product is still equal to zero. Now let's actually do the dot product. So it's the product of the first coordinates, negative four times x minus one, 
plus the product of the second coordinate, so 2 times y minus 2, plus 1 times z minus 3, this dot product still equals 0. Now we can just distribute, so negative 4x plus 4, plus 2y minus 4, plus z minus 3 equals 0. Let's see, I can cancel out. I have a plus 4 and a minus 4. We have negative 4x plus 2y plus z, and then let me put that 3 on the other side. This is the general form. So negative 4 is, is playing the role of the coefficient a when you compare with the equation I wrote at the top. 2 is b, 1 is c, and then 3 on the right-hand side, this is d. Notice negative 4, 2, 1, those coefficients on the left-hand side is the orthogonal vector. So what that tells us is if we have the general equation for a plane, the coefficients a, b, and c give us the coefficients for an orthogonal vector. Okay, let me try to graph this. It's not going to be a great picture, but let me show you one approach. So I start with my axes, which satisfy the right-hand rule, so x, y, and z. From the general form, it's easy to find the intercepts for each of these axes. I like the x-intercept the least because of the negative sign, so let me actually work right to left here. To find where this plane intercepts the z-axis, set x and y to 0, and you get z equals 3. Actually, let me rewrite this equation at the top just without all the notation. So negative 4x plus 2y plus z equals 3. Set x and y to be 0. Tells you the z-intercept is 3. Okay, so if this is 3, our plane passes through this point. Similarly, if I set x and z to be 0, our y-intercept is 2 thirds. Okay, this picture is not going to be to scale. I'm just going to say that this is the point two-thirds on the y-axis. And then, again, this picture is not going to be great now because I'm going to have an x-intercept, which is negative. But if I set y and z to be 0, our x-intercept is negative 3 fourths. Okay, so let me extend the x-axis like that. And then let's say, and not to scale, just so the picture has some depth to it, but my x-intercept is negative 3 fourths. Rule of thumb when you're sketching pictures in R3 is perhaps it's not exactly to scale, and that's why we label. Okay, so this plane goes on forever. But if you have three intercepts, if the plane intersects all of the axes, then you can give kind of an accurate slice of this plane or an accurate subset of the plane as it passes through one of the octants. Okay, so this triangular region is how this plane passes through that octant. And you can kind of imagine that the plane sort of goes like this. Okay, so you could try to extend that plane if you want, but here I was really just looking to show you how to graph the intercepts. So that's one nice thing about the general equation is it makes it a little bit easier to find the intercepts on the axes compared to the vector equation. Another nice feature of the general equation is that it removes some of the ambiguity. If I have this plane and I tell you that negative 4, 2, 1 is orthogonal to the plane, and so your left-hand side of the equation is negative 4x plus 2y plus z equals, and then you have to find the right-hand side, you will find 3. Everyone on Earth who solves this problem correctly would have the same right-hand side. So if everybody wrote down negative 4x plus 2y plus z equals, they would all write down 3. However, there are infinitely many points on the plane. So if we compare this to the vector equation, I could have the vector negative 4, 2, 1, and the vector x, y, z. But every single person in the class could choose a different point on the plane. So when you're comparing your work to someone else, or you're assessing if somebody has done this correctly, the general form may be preferred just because it makes it easier to quickly determine if we've come up with the same plane. Let's look at an example of having three non-collinear points determine a plane. So the points P, Q, and R lie on the plane. I have four steps for us to complete here. First, we want to find the normal vector to the plane. 
Then we'll write down the vector equation of the plane. Then we'll write down what's called the scalar equation of the plane. And we'll conclude with the general form of the plane. Okay, so we have three points on this plane, P, Q, and R. So let's say this is point P, so 2, 5, 1. This is point Q, negative 1, 0, 0. And this is point R, negative 1, 3, 2. I've just drawn these randomly on my slide as three points, but you could imagine the slide itself now as being the plane, and these are three points on the plane. We would like to find a normal vector or an orthogonal vector to the plane. I'm saying v here, but of course it's not unique because if n is perpendicular to the plane, so is negative n and 3n and negative 10n, etc. So let's find a normal vector to the plane. And how do we do that? Well, what we need to do is realize that from these three points, we can create two vectors which live on the plane. So in particular, PQ and PR both live on the plane, which means that both PQ and PR are orthogonal to the orthogonal vector n. So we have a vector operation where if you take two vectors and do this vector operation, the result is a vector which is perpendicular to the two vectors we started with. Do you remember what it is? It's the cross product. So if I'm looking for a vector which is perpendicular to PQ and perpendicular to PR, I can cross those two vectors and the result will satisfy that property. So let's let N, the vector we're trying to find, be the cross product PQ cross PR. Okay, so now I just need to compute this cross product. I will do it the way I usually do it. So I, J, K along my first row. And then what is PQ? I should probably figure that out. That's going to be the coordinates of Q minus the coordinates of P. So negative 1 minus 2 is negative 3, negative 5, negative 1. Okay, so that's the coordinates of PQ. And then for PR, the coordinates of PR are the coordinates of R minus the coordinates of P. So negative 1 minus 2 is negative 3. 3 minus 5 is negative 2. 2 minus 1 is 1. Okay, so then the third row in my 3 by 3 array is negative 3, negative 2, 1. Okay, so now I do this cross product. So my first component is going to be negative 5 times negative 1. So that's negative 5 minus 2, so negative 7. My second component is going to be negative 3 minus 3, negative 6, but then I change the sign to 6. And then my third component is 6 minus 15, so negative 9. This vector n that we just computed gives us the orthogonal direction for the plane that we're looking for. Note that I could have done PR cross PQ, and I would have ended up with 7, negative 6, 9. That would work just as well. Or I could have perhaps done this a little bit differently and ended up with something like negative 14, 12, negative 18. That would be twice the vector that I found, and that would also work. We just need a vector that describes the orthogonal sense of direction. Okay, now that we have our vector n, we can write down the vector equation of the plane. For this, we need a known point on the plane, but we have three options. Okay, so we can use P, Q, or R. It doesn't matter which one. I'm going to choose Q just because it has so many zeros in it, and that might make things a little bit easier. So what we have is n the vector negative 7, 6, negative 9, dot the vector difference, x, y, z, representing the position vector for any other point on the plane, minus the point we know, which I've chosen q, so that's going to be minus the vector negative 1, 0, 0. This dot product needs to be 0.
That is the vector equation of this plane. It would be completely correct to take this negative 1, 0, 0 here and write 2, 5, 1 or negative 1, 3, 2 using P or R. You know, it would give you the same plane. Let's finish this example by finding the scalar equation of the plane. That's a phrase I haven't defined yet, but it's real quick. And then we'll do the general form of the plane. So for three, the scalar equation of the plane just means go ahead and do this vector difference and compute the dot product, but maybe don't fully simplify. This is just an intermediary form. We don't use it too often, but I just wanted to bring it up. So it would be negative seven times x plus one plus six times y minus zero minus nine times z minus zero equals zero. So what I did here is I first did the vector subtraction, x plus one, y minus zero, z minus zero, and then I did the dot product. So it's the product of the first components plus the product of the second components plus the product of the third components. Okay, so that's really just one step on our way to arriving at the general form. So now if I fully expand and simplify, we'll get negative seven x minus seven plus six y minus zero minus nine z equals zero. So let's keep our x, y, and z terms on the left and move our constant term to the right. And we'll have negative seven x plus six y minus nine z equals seven. And that is our general form. Again, notice that from this general form, you can quickly read off the orthogonal vector that we found earlier, negative seven, six, and negative nine. Those are the coefficients of x, y, z on one side of the equation. What's true also about the general form is if I took the points P, Q, and R and plugged them in one at a time, it would return a true statement. So you can check that negative seven times two, that's the X coordinate of P, plus six times five, that's the Y coordinate of B, minus nine times one, that's the Z coordinate of P, equals Let's see, that's negative 14 minus 9 is negative 23, plus 30 is going to give me 7, as expected. And same thing if I plug in the x, y, z components of q. On the left-hand side, I would also get 7, and ditto for r. In fact, that gives you a quick way of going directly to the general form and bypassing the vector equation. If you have the orthogonal vector, go ahead and write down the left-hand side, and then just plug in the point you know. So once I had my orthogonal vector, negative seven, six, negative nine, I can write down this left-hand side and then just plug in P as I did here to immediately tell me that the right-hand side is seven. Let's finish this lecture with this example. We're gonna have another lecture with examples of lines and planes. So this isn't our final example with plane, but it'll be the final example in this video. So we want to find the vector equation of a plane through the point P, 6, negative 8, negative 5, which is orthogonal to the plane 8x minus y minus z equals 3. So this question is a little bit weird because there's not actually one unique plane. Notice I said here a plane, not the plane. And that's because, if I go ahead and answer the second question, there are infinitely many possible planes that would answer this question. To see why that's true, just look at the desk in front of you and declare a random point on the desk to be the point P. Now, if you lift a sheet of paper to be orthogonal to your desk and containing the point P, you can rotate it around and you will find that any way that you rotate that paper, so long as it's passing through P and orthogonal to your desk would answer the question. So there are infinitely many solutions here. So let's just find one. Okay, so returning to our first question, how can we determine if two planes are orthogonal? Because if I sketch a picture, here's one plane. I'm gonna draw a plane which isn't exactly orthogonal to this plane, but that's okay. So let's say I draw this plane 
they intersect in this straight line. Let's define the angle between these two planes to be the smaller of the two angles that they form. So here's the smaller one. The larger one would be this one out here. That's not the angle that we're going to use. So whichever angle is smaller, let's call that angle theta, the angle between these two planes. Well, how we've been characterizing planes is in terms of having an orthogonal direction. So let's say that this vector gives us the orthogonal direction for one plane, and this vector gives us the orthogonal direction for the other plane. Then the angle between these two planes is the same as the angle between their orthogonal vectors. So two planes are orthogonal when their orthogonal vectors are perpendicular. So what we want now is to find the vector equation of a plane containing the known point 6, negative 8, negative 5, whose normal vector, whose orthogonal vector, is perpendicular to the orthogonal vector for the plane 8x minus y minus z equals 3. Notice that the vector 8, negative 1, negative 1 is perpendicular to the plane 8x minus y minus z equals 3. To get that vector, I just read the coefficients off of the left-hand side, so 8, negative 1, negative 1. So we need a vector n, which is perpendicular to the vector 8, negative 1, negative 1. If I come over to my picture, it's like we can think of this blue vector here as 8, negative 1, negative 1. And what we're looking for is this vector n. How do you find a vector which is perpendicular to another vector? You just need to find a vector whose dot product with that vector is 0. So any non-zero vector which satisfies that n dot 8 negative 1 negative 1 equals 0 will work. We've seen this before. If you're just trying to find a vector which is perpendicular to another vector, what you can do is zero out one of the coordinates and swap the other two, negating one of their signs. So let's choose n equal to, um, let me zero out the 8, or zero out that x coordinate, and then I'll do 1, negative 1. You can check that that vector is orthogonal to 8, negative 1, negative 1. In other words, when you take their dot product, you get 0, minus 1, plus 1. Okay, so one such plane, since there are infinitely many, would be 0, 1, negative 1, dot the vector difference x, y, z, minus the known point 6, negative 8, negative 5. That dot product needs to be 0. That determines one of the planes that would meet the criteria for this question. We'll do more examples working with lines and planes next. But before you do that, I would review the vector equation of a line, the scalar parametric equation of the lines, and this lecture, because the next lecture will have some more challenging examples. Thank you for your attention.